This was where world domination started. The very first shows with the singers Stephen Duffy were, uh, were real art school. We were covered in projection of architecture. We'd heard about the Velvet Underground and we liked that idea of having a, making a multimedia experience. It was, a, it was a very strange sound, but from that I suppose we developed and decided that we wanted to make music that was going to end up on the dance floor. Roger we knew from um, the scene in Birmingham. He, he was known as being a, a, a good drummer. And it was only when I met um, John and Nick that I found two other people that had the same commitment and the same single-mindedness. It's when Roger joined the band that it really defined things because John then switched from guitar to bass, um, which I'm eternally thankful for. I mean, everybody kind of thinks this is the band that was born with a, a silver spoon in its mouth, but uh, we actually started in a squat in an industrial, very industrial part of Birmingham. This is a real Ruttles moment, <laughs> isn't it? This is where it all started in this little oh. house here. I don't think it was this one. I, don't, I think the door was on the other side, you know. I think it was here. It was here. You think this was it? Yes. Number 260. This is where I joined Are the band. Are you sure, Roger? This very building here. Then again, it could be another one up there. But I think it's this one. Roger, John and I had um, already bonded and formed a pretty strong musical unit, but we were in desperate need of a guitarist and a singer. Eventually, we decided to advertise ourselves. I think it was in Melody Maker. They wanted a guitar player who was kind of somewhere between Steve Jones, Mick Ronson, and Dave Gilmore. And I thought, well, I can play all three of them. <laughs> so which one should I be? We got, I think, 17 responses. And uh, I looked at all the names, and one of them was Andy Taylor. And I said, no way are we having him. We've got two Taylors already. This is going to be ridiculous. People just wouldn't take it seriously. No way. He came down from Newcastle on the train. He, uh, he actually turned up in a pair of dungarees, I think. He had such a thick accent. Mick says, I have a heavy Newcastle accent, and he doesn't have a Birmingham accent. John and I were looking at each other, thinking, what, what did he say? I went into an old flag. I mean, I couldn't understand a fucking word he said. And he couldn't understand me. You know, when he started to play, he was just, uh, he had this incredible edge to his playing. And he was like the best musician that we'd ever seen. And he, he had some experience, but he understood what we were trying to do very quickly. And it worked. Which was quite funny, because, you know, you kind of think this is, well, it's like Billy Elliot or something. <laughs> the funny part of it is that we sort of told him that we had a lead singer and that the singer wasn't there that day, because we figured we're never going to get a guitarist if they think we've still got to find a singer. Look, there's a pub just up here. We'll just pull up there, This yeah. pub is the only pub I've ever seen Nick Rhodes <laughs> in, <laughs> in fact. Well, he only went Having in there. a pint and a cheese it... sandwich. Yeah, he only goes in pubs if he's looking for drummers. Oh, that's true. And that, once you joined, that was it. You didn't have to go. Yeah, we used again. to have meetings in this pub. Did we? Yeah. What did we used to meet about? This is where we used to plan. Oh, before we moved uptown to the Rum Runner. Yeah. We actually found Simon through a barmaid, believe it or not. And she said, "I know what you want. There's this guy called Simon Le Bon." He's at drama school in Birmingham, and he looks like you guys. He looks like he belongs with you guys. And he can sing. He's been in a bunch of punk bands. You should get him. I uh, turned up in a pair of skin-tight, washed-out, leopard-skin pants. And as soon as he walked in, we thought, OK. I mean, I just wore... I thought I'd just put, put my best clothes on that I thought was, was going to appeal to a band, you know, as you would, going to an audition with Duran, Duran, who previously I'd heard had a very stylish lead singer. He's got a book, it's filled with lyrics, and they were really great lyrics. Let's just hope he can sing. And uh, he just had this amazing melodic voice that just seemed to fit perfectly um, with the band. So there's like no question, you know, he was in. What they really wanted was lyrics, and I came with, with loaded with lyrics. 
we were looking for each other. Simon was doing drama, and he walked out of it because he found what he was looking for. So it is about sort of knowing where you fit. It's just five slices of fucking pizza. Mine's pepperoni and chilies. <laughs> Nick's is completely vegetarian, but you put it all together, and everyone knows what, where they got to fit, and it, it, that, that jigsaw element of that, I think, is really important. We all look evil in this, apart from Roger, I think, you know, it's look. Mick, the rake. Andy looks like the, um, the debauched uh, son of the local squire. John, no, John looks like the, the sort of the slightly mad gamekeeper, poacher. I look like some kind of perverted sailor. And Roger actually looks like the victim. <laughs> it is. It's, a, it's like a picaresque novel with Roger Taylor and all the bad characters he kind of comes in contact with. And can, can we steal his innocence away from him? Actually, and the answer is yes, we can. <laughs> it was the, the film of Barbarella that, um, that I saw on TV one night. And we were just looking for a name, looking for something different. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody was calling them the, 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 the something, you know, the clash, the boys, the damned, the this, the that, you know. And I just, I liked the idea of Duran Duran because it was just out of nowhere. It just didn't have any connection with anything else that was going on at the time. When we started the band, um, John and I had um, quite a strong vision, really, of what we wanted to achieve. We used to listen to records and... Um, play chart buster <laughs> it was this this game this board game that uh, was like throw a six enter the top ten um, you know it's funny because I, I came across a piece of paper the other day at my dad's house with all these all these potential band names on it you know and they're all like uh, yeah, Arabia and industry and, and one of them is Arcadia which was funny absolutely I mean God, I mean, the, the late 70s was a fantastic time to be, to be a teenager, you know, in Britain. I mean, Roger was a punk. You know, the, the, the punk rock revolution of 1977, you know, just, you know, you didn't need any experience. You just didn't need anything. You just needed a, a desire. Punk had such an edge and an attitude. And that really was the, uh, the thing that finally pushed us into saying, yeah, we're forming the band. Uh, I went through a succession of school bands until, um, you know, the bands kind of got better and better. But the hardest thing was to find people that were um, committed. I had this band and we wrote stuff and, and it, was, it was called Dog Days. And then, we, then that kind of split up and I had a band called Rov Ostrov which was a more kind of new wave, sort of post-punk kind of band. I, I had to survive playing in covers bands when I was younger, sort of 15, 16 when I left school, that's what I did. And we were, you know, we were broke, we didn't have a penny between us, but we, we weren't interested in anything else apart from being in a band. All right, what I remember about that Cheapside joint was that, um, a couple of the guys that were living there, Andy and Dave, they'd been in TVI. And when they split up, mm. Dave Cusworth's new band sort of took up residency downstairs, didn't they? Yeah. And we moved in to the upstairs, because Andy, bands in Andy there, was singing. So downstairs there was the Hawks, and upstairs there was Duran, right? And yes. that, was the, that was the place where we came back, to, we, 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 we came back from the pub one evening, and, and they'd scrawl, disco sucks. On the, the door, door. Oh, yes, on the door yes. where we rehearsed. I guess I was probably about 10 years old when I first decided I was going to be a musician. And um, at that stage, you know, people don't take you too seriously when you say, no, this is what I'm going to do. I was, I was a hummer. I was humming tunes and, and a whistler. I mean, it sounds a cliche, but I literally got my mum's pots and pans out of the kitchen and just started kind of playing on anything that I could find. My nan had a piano which always attracted me. And I played piano as well, which I hated. I hated piano lessons. Desperately hated those. Then by about the age of 13, I think I, I saved enough pocket money 
and finally got myself a kit. Well, I did get an acoustic guitar when I was about um, 16, maybe 15 or 16, but um, nobody ever, uh, nobody showed me how to tune it. I I've always really just been a guitar freak. Um, I play guitar most days. I've always played guitar most days. It's just quite a, it's quite a useful friend and uh, can be quite a profitable tool. Synthesizers had come down to a price where they were really affordable for the first time. And uh, I, I bought a small one called a Wasp, and then I didn't really ever uh, look back. I didn't know a thing about sequences and electronics. I wanted to, but, you know, you, you, once you get past sort of Birmingham, they don't sell that sort of equipment. <laughs> Get the rest it's the jacket. Of it's the jacket. Oh, yes, yes, right. yes, yes. It's yes. going to be warm, though, isn't it? Well, I'm going to take it off as soon as I get on. Look at the sequence. Look at the sequence. It's a superstar. It's a superstar. It's a superstar. I feel like a star. <laughs> I think my first big influence was uh, John Bonham, I think. I, I loved the Beatles, but I was really a rock fan and ACDC, sort of Van Halen, late 70s. I loved bands like that. The first bass lines that I became aware of were mostly in, in, in disco and R&B. The big ones for, for me were, were Jim Morrison. Hendrix to guys like Gary Moore. Keith Moon. Patti Smith. Bernard Edwards, who was the, the bassist in Chic. And Jimmy Page. T-Rex was a huge, huge influence on me. And Eric Clapton. Obviously, craft work for me personally were very important. Nick was listening to Eno. And, and I'd, never, uh, I'd never ever thought about that as a, uh, as a layer of music. David Bowie would be uh, the defining influence in Roxy Music. And then David Bowie pretty much changed my life. We wanted to really marry glam rock, punk and disco, I think, was, was kind of our manifesto. Are you playing with us? No. You're not? Our creative process is a, is a complete nightmare. Uh, there is no doubt about it. And we used to get into a room, start playing, and see what happened. Um. <laughs> we don't ever give in easily, any of us. I'm right. <laughs> but I've got a problem, because so am I. No, but you didn't have the Beatles or the Stones in the 50s. I don't want to be playing yeah, the same no. fucking line the whole way through. It sounds great to me. It's a breath of fresh air. We just get in a room play and jam until we, till we get something. There's no magic formula. It's a very enjoyable thing to do um, because, because, it is, because you don't know where it's going to go and you don't know what's going to happen. We write as the Beatles would have written 30 years ago. When you hear stuff just start to, to, to come into existence right there. It was real high energy because everybody was playing all the time. Nobody ever left a gap because they wanted to be heard all the time. The stronger elements get noticed. So, you know, whether Simon sings something and you're like, that's, that's, a, that's a great idea, let's sit on that for a while. So you end up with that combination in a room and you know that something special is going to happen, something, something good will happen quickly. And it's like, oh, I found a bass line. Yeah, great, OK, well, I'll stay with that. So you feel good, you know, until everybody's got something. We then start to hone down every part and the lyrics and, you know, the new album was a three-year process. I, I always wrote songs on my own and, and I'd, I'd bring in bits and then they'd get changed. Really, we have to find the seed and once we found that, then we start arguing about how to grow the tree. Well, I mean, we were top of the world. I mean, the biggest band in the world. And it was amazing. We loved it. We, and, I, and, and, and I think we've always been very grateful and always felt very lucky that it was us who was, the, who was that band in the 80s. And, and we've got respect for our fans and, and we love the crowd and we love the moment and we love the show. We still do. It's something that, we, that hasn't changed at all. Particularly with Duran Duran, I mean, our live show is, is so exciting. Um, it's real high energy. I, I do remember when we played in front of a crowd that was almost all girls. And they'd be like screaming maniacs. We have an amazing relationship with the audience through the live show. It's a scream. It kind of rips your, rips your ears off. You know, we get to the hotel and there'd be like 200 of them outside the, the foyer, you know, with 
pressed up against the glass. And now it, it's like this roar. I mean, we've got an older audience, obviously. A lot of these people, they're still with us. They've grown up with us and they, and they still want to come and see us. I think people listen more now. I think people used, the kids used to just come and scream. And I think we could have walked on that stage and done anything. I mean, uh, the, the, the original five, I mean, we kind of imploded. As it came bigger and bigger, I think we became more and more detached from the audience. You kind of roll up to the arena in your fleet of limos, you go on stage, and then you, you kind of ushered out back to the hotel, and you know, you, you're very protected. So I think it got less and less fun, actually. There was no doubt that um, things had started to wear away a little. It felt like that, that, that somebody pulled the, the plug out of the bath and the water was slowly running out. It didn't feel like a, a gang anymore. It became become work, and I think people start to look in different directions. I was barely holding on. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but, you know, it was a... I mean, it's a pretty powerful experience, you know, going through that kind of that fame, that fame mill. The pain that goes with when you're doing that well and you're in that much pain, and, the, and you're arguing and fighting, and it's all going on around you, and it's bringing you up Eiffel Tower shooting fucking videos and that, but uh, no one's really enjoying it. I mean, I knew how to be a pop star, you know, but I just didn't know how to live. But, you know, John and I were snorting half of Peru at the time, so our judgment was flawed. It got dicey, and I guess I wasn't the only one either. It got very strange, because I think the spirit of the band kind of disappeared at some point during 85. As a group, we couldn't, we couldn't keep it together. Live Aid was the last gig we did. And we're all on the same stage, but really I think we we're just in different headspaces. You're on the edge of a cliff, and someone says, and you're doing Live Aid to two billion people. It's almost like it's set up, you know, there, there was a firing squad was waiting for us. Like, it's really like chemistry, you know, I mean, I, I've read about you know, the chemistry of musicians ever since I was a kid, you know, reading the music papers. I never really knew what it meant until the five of us got back together. Somehow, I guess we'd always been asked the question, why don't you put the original lineup back together? When are you gonna put the original lineup back together? And that question had been haunting us virtually since the day we first broke up the original lineup. So I didn't think it would ever happen again. I thought the time had passed. I thought, uh, I thought so much time had gone by and so much water under the bridge that I thought, that's it, that's, that's history now. I left a message on John Taylor's answer machine and saying, I'd, I'd love to see you. I missed him very much, actually. I missed John terribly. And there was a message from Simon that he called, and I just thought, yeah, yeah, this is... So he came over. I, I just went and sat there and sat by his pool and drank tea with him for a whole afternoon, sat in the sunshine, and we talked about things. And, and that's when we said, you know, what, what, what about, what about, what do you think? Do you think we could do it? Do you think that, that we could get the five of us back together? We said, well, let's, you know, let's get Nick over. And that was, that was a big thing, getting Nick to go and see John. Because they kind of, they'd known each other since they were 10 years old. So, and when John left, I think Nick took it very personally. Simon and I sat down with John in Los Angeles and uh, at his house and we, we chatted about it and said, well, what do you think? And John said, well, I'd love to do it. I think we could really make something very special. And of course, it was like, well, what do, what do you think Roger's doing? What do, you, what do you think Andy's doing? So we give him a call. And the phone rang and um, it was John. And he said, uh, yeah, I want to talk to you about something to do with the band. I was, I was really shocked, actually. You'd never thought you'd find the five of you ever agreeing to do anything at the same time. And when everybody did, within the space of a few hours, certainly within a 24-hour period, that was like a, you know, we've had a miracle. <laughs> it almost took a year from that point um, before we actually got in a room together and started playing. I think, I think we, we, we all we're looking forward very much to that, to the opportunity to do that, to see what would happen musically when the five of us got into a room. And we plugged in and we started playing together. And it was at that point that I knew it was gonna work. 
because the sound we made was instantly recognisable as Duran Duran. And, um, and boy, did it start happening. It really did. It's been a great experience to go back and retrieve a great part of your past and, you know, move it forward again with, a, you know, with your friends, you know, a great bunch of guys. The set list gag is um, ongoing. So you figure out the set on the way back, won't you? What? OK, so we're doing the Cardiff, the Cardiff sets. So I thought we should move planet Earth later. That's a great place for Adam Watch Your Love. Yeah, it's always, um, it's always a bit of a process deciding on our, uh, our set list. Notorious reflex, careless memories, wild boys. It wasn't the set I gave what? you. Girls, careless memories, wild boys. One too many slow okay. ones for me. What were you thinking of changing night boat with? Yeah, no, I, I don't not care. Too many changes. Let's, just, let's add problem. union. There's no final solution. Not tiger, tiger should that. go before the chauffeur. Not a bad idea. What about white lines? New religion there. New religion there, yeah. We usually still arguing ten minutes before we go, we go on stage. I thought they were all too close together. Yeah, so let's put, let's add union. Well, we can't. I don't think we can get any longer. And that's the way it goes every single night. It's um, I'm waiting for it to change, but so far nothing gives. I woke up this morning. and I'm like, oh, I'm playing we're playing Wembley today. All oh, right, yeah. Oh, turn the phone off. <laughs> In 2004, we had this incredible achievement. The British tour for us was um, pretty extraordinary. You know, I, th I don't think any of us imagined it would sell so, so quickly and so well. That tour was the payoff, really. That was the payoff for the whole reunion. It was fantastic to do it. I think we broke our own record for, for the amount of people we played to in the UK. The tour was an opportunity, you know, just to get back in the house under the roof with with so many people that you know you know hey we named our kid after you we we got married because of you well, i lost my virginity to you you know i mean every night was just it was fantastic it was uh it was the it was the best tour we've ever done and i think that's what it's all about actually i think all the albums we do and the the promo and the interviews and the recording and the songwriting it's all about that moment really about stepping on stage and this tremendous sense of togetherness that we we have. I think everybody in the band really, um, really enjoyed every moment of it because we couldn't have planned the thing better. I don't think we ever used to smile as much on stage back in back in the eighties. I think we were much more sort of like, you know, sort of sucking the cheeks in and and, and posing and this kind of wave of happiness and, and joy that come, kind of comes off the stage now is really just an expression of, of that sense of achievement, I think, that we all feel. I mean, that was cracking. That was fucking cracking. That was everything it needed to be. Yeah, we did yeah. it. The yeah. sound was so good on stage. Oh, God, I was... Fantastic. Magnificent. Yeah. I was just... Stand on stage. Uh, I was yeah. roaring at the end. Andy Hamilton goes back, he, he played on Planet Earth, he, he played the original solo on Rio. Strangely enough, I mean, when I think about it, no one stood the test of time, he's still here. Guy's been with us now 23 years. We had more scope on this British tour, so we were able to play songs like Tiger Tiger. We'd never played that before. It's a sort of three, four minute instrumental. It's just another little weapon in the arsenal, I think, to have a great sax player come on. It's a Roxy Music affliction. It's, it's important in a set to have a real dynamic, to have real highs and nice, calm, low points. And, and Tiger Tiger really is um, like this beautiful flower in the middle of the set. In I Phoenix, know. I couldn't move Why around Why are they different all? sizes? They're actually the same size, aren't they? Oh, I didn't know. I thought Rogers might be a possibility. I don't know. It, it is, but I wouldn't do that for... <laughs> The idea for the stage on this tour was uh, actually a concept John and I had. <laughs> the, um, you know, the round stage was, uh, was a real Spinal Tap moment because we were in America somewhere and, um, and I don't know how it started, but, you know, Nick and I were sitting together and we started sketching this round, all these circles. We had a round lighting rig. And Andy leans over and goes, well, it's a double D, isn't it? It's a double D. We could do it like that, two Ds, the light rig, and then if we had one, and then another thing in the middle, and three, and, and all this, seriously, was on a napkin. And the napkin, just like Spinal Tap, was given to the LD. And I mean, when you're looking down from above, it'll look like one of those... Um, Sold the rise. Kandinsky things or something, you know? 
Alex, our lighting designer, took it and of course made it really beautiful, uh, put it into his computer and, and developed the idea into something that was going to work. And I just thought that was actually said a lot about where we're at. You know, you, don't, you hate it when everyone's all off reading their books and like, you know, I'm too old for this now and that. You know, you're still standing buzzed up about how much can we spend on fucking lights to make it look great. It's great, it's great what you did. You'll trip out when you see it. It's, on the big it's screen. It's great. On the big oh, screen yeah. when we're all playing in the... along. Imagery and presentation has always been very important to us. Nick is like, when we're on stage, you know, he's the guy that's like, he's looking at the screens, how's the screens doing, you know, he's like, yeah, everybody else is just, we're all just bearing down on our instruments. One of the films that we made um, for the projection was the anime for Careless Memories. That's something that uh, really came out of the blue. Um, a guy that we, we work with a lot, Gary Oldno, who's also designed um, a lot of our uh, imagery um, for, for the projection, uh, he really wanted to do a piece um, of, of animation. He found somebody to work with in London who came up with the most incredible concept. Um, and I thought Careless Memories, being one of our more violent songs, was, was the perfect thing. So there's the five of us created. And if you'd seen the initial drawings and how we ended up there, it was, it was really um, a great success story. Um, it's a moment in the show where you know that actually the audience are watching the screens. They're not really watching us. And it, it's, it's worth every second. It's a real highlight for us. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Oh, this is the first one ever. Yeah. First program ever. Good grief. Have you had this since 1981? Wow. I don't think I've seen this for about 20 years. There you go. You could do this for us. Yeah.